two times Angel Michael faces Satan. So you don't miss any video that are uploaded every day. Alright, let's keep rolling. Angel Michael had two significant confrontations with Satan. The first one involved defending Moses' body. Michael holds a prominent place among angelic figures, standing alongside Gabriel. As an archangel, he plays a pivotal role in God's heavenly assembly. Scholars and believers often delve into debates about his duties and achievements, shrouded in mystery despite his importance. The name Michael comes from Hebrew, meaning who is comparable to God. Interestingly, many parents name their sons Michael without fully grasping the name's depth. The prophet Daniel introduces Michael to us. Daniel 10 verse 3 mentions a clash lasting 21 days between the prince of the kingdom of Persia and Michael, referred to as one of the chief princes, aiding Daniel. Michael's involvement in spiritual battles is quite apparent. With his consistent connection to such struggles, it's almost fitting to dub him a general. The Bible hints at other angelic counterparts with the phrase one of the chief princes, but remains mum about any archangels beyond Michael. Jude 9 uniquely describes Michael disputing with Satan over Moses' body, an event absent elsewhere in scripture. The absence of details fuels pondering on the conflict's nature and significance. It also reveals Michael's title as Archangel, meaning Chief Angel or Messenger in Greek. Before we begin I would appreciate if you would like the video. So that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. If you are not subscribed I recommend you to subscribe and activate the bell. The origin of Jude's knowledge raises questions. Some speculate it was from passed down traditions. Speculation surrounds the disagreement between Michael and Satan regarding Moses' body. Some believe Satan aimed to build a shrine, leading Israelites to idolatrous worship. Michael, the angelic representative, safeguarded them by keeping the burial site secret. Moses' death remains shrouded in biblical mystery. He passed away at an astonishing age of 120, yet remained physically and mentally strong until the end, defying the typical effects of aging. His unique demise sparked various interpretations, especially as he couldn't enter the promised land due to disobedience at Meribah Kadesh. As Moses stood on Mount Nebo, glimpsing the land, he couldn't set foot in Canaan. God granted him this sight before he passed away. The remarkable elevation of Mount Pisgah, for 1,500 feet above, magnifies the feet of Moses ascending it at 120. There was no wide trail for Moses, his determination and God's guidance led him. Moses, aware of his impending passing, accepted it as God's will. Joshua had been appointed his successor. When Moses passed, God personally buried him, concealing the tomb. This is where the encounter between Michael and Satan comes into play. Despite Michael's esteemed position, he approached Satan with respect, entrusting rebuke to God, acknowledging the Almighty's ultimate authority. Most angels deliver messages, but Michael actively contends against evil forces, akin to Zechariah chapter 3, where the Lord rebukes Satan for accusing Joshua. Despite Michael's immense power, his submission to God remains a testament to his strength. It's a reminder that submission doesn't diminish an individual's strength, purpose, or value. Michael, despite his might, acted in the Lord's name, respecting his office and position. You and I both have a lot to learn, especially about bowing down to God. Think about it, we're creatures while he's the creator. So, what gives us the right to question anything he does? Don't get me wrong, we all grapple with doubts, but here's the thing, God isn't just the creator, 
He's the Redeemer too. He's the caring force behind us, but he's also above, righteous, and fair. God doesn't make mistakes, everything he does is on point. So, why is it sometimes tough to put our trust in him? Do we genuinely recognize his authority or appreciate who he is? When the time comes for accountability, Jesus Christ will say, you talked the talk but didn't walk the walk. Each person just went their own way, doing whatever felt right to them. That's humanity in a nutshell. So, let's talk about you and me today. Let's take a leaf out of Michael the Archangel's book. He faced the conflict where Satan himself was the third player. Lucifer, also known as the Morning Star in Hebrew, was a top-tier angel in God's celestial crew alongside Michael and Gabriel. But here's where things went sideways. Lucifer got a bit too big for his angelic britches. He challenged God, and that's a big no-no. In Luke 10 verse 18, Jesus talks about witnessing Satan's fall from heaven like lightning. He uses this story to warn us about the perils of letting pride control our choices. Ezekiel 28 paints a picture of Lucifer's downfall. He was a dazzling, super-wise, and beautifully adorned angel, one of the anointed cherubs. But his pride got the best of him, he wanted equality with God. This guy even managed to sway some angels to join his rebellion against God's authority. That didn't end well for him. The Bible describes Lucifer's cunning attempts to sway angels away from God and his ultimate fall due to arrogance and disobedience. Ezekiel 28 verses 16 to 19 tells of his downfall, brought about by his own pride and a heart that sought self-glory. Lucifer's rebellion wasn't a quick thing, it was a long-planned and organized revolt, convincing a third of the angels to follow him. His pride, born from the blessings God granted him, led to this chaos. Isaiah 14 verses 11 to 15 is pretty telling of Lucifer's thoughts. He wanted to reach the heights of heaven, even aiming to sit atop God's throne. It was all about trying to be like the Most High. Pride was the culprit here, the first sin in the universe, spawning rebellion. And the thing is, it was pride from the blessings God himself gave Lucifer, power, authority, beauty, and wisdom, all gifts from above. You know, sometimes we wonder why Satan was so keen on getting Moses' body. Truth is, whatever his plan was, we knew it wasn't good. Understanding an opponent's strategy helps us prep our defenses and stand our ground better. In the Bible, there are plenty of examples showing Satan's game plan, stealing, killing, and destroying. These tactics might not seem subtle, but Satan has a way of making them look deceptively subtle. So, let's talk about Michael stepping up to defend Moses. Picture this, Michael, with the spirit and boldness, tells Satan, Hey, the Lord rebukes you. That's some serious backbone right there. Now, on to the war in heaven. Revelation is a game changer, not just for the first century church, but for future ages too, especially for those witnessing Christ's second coming. John penned this unique book before bidding adieu. Revelation dives into the ultimate battle between good and evil. It's like a championship fight, you know? Revelation 12 gets into the nitty-gritty, describing the showdown between Michael and the dragon, Satan. Spoiler alert, Satan and his squad didn't stand a chance. They got the boot from heaven, and there was no way back in. Talk about a cosmic eviction. Satan's portrayal in cartoons with red horns and a pitchfork? Yeah, that's more folklore than Bible fact. Job 1 shows Satan chillin' in heaven, 
in Revelation 12 paints a picture of him and his crew trying to storm heaven in a cosmic conflict. Now, how's this battle fought? It's not your typical throwdown, it's a spiritual tussle, fought in the realm of truth and deception, fear and faith. Ephesians 6 verse 12 spells it out, our fight isn't against flesh and blood, but against dark forces. Plus, at the cross, Satan's power got clipped, big time. Revelation 12 describes the dragon, aka Satan, getting tossed down, losing his VIP access to heaven. But here's the thing, believers triumphed over Satan, standing firm in their faith in Jesus. That's the ticket to victory in this spiritual war. But Satan, oh boy, he's not taking this defeat lightly. He knows his clock's ticking, and he's not holding back. He's on a rage rampage, especially targeting Israel, the land of the Messiah's birth. Even with Satan's eviction from heaven, it doesn't mean an end to suffering on earth. But believers keep standing strong, testifying to Christ's victory, even if it means facing the worst. Hey, you know how Satan likes to throw shade at us? Yeah, he's the accuser, always trying to trip us up. But here's the deal, we've got Jesus in our corner, backing us up big time. Satan may want to mess things up, but Jesus, he's the ultimate good guy, looking out for us. Let's dive into the lessons here. First off, every win comes with a battle. No crown without a fight, right? But hey, the good stuff? Totally worth fighting for. We're not meant to do this solo, communities where the real win happens. And when victory comes, it's time to party heaven itself throws down when we win. So, we're talking about Michael the Archangel, a top dog leading other angels. He's got some serious muscle when it comes to taking on evil spirits. Check this, in the book of Revelation, Michael's like the captain rallying other angels to duke it out with the devil and his gang. It's not just a story, it's a sneak peek into what's really going down in the spirit world. It's a whole showdown between spiritual forces. Daniel's a prophet who spills some beans about Michael. He's got a direct connection with Israel, and apparently, He's got a major role in the end times. Daniel 12 verses 1 to 3 has the scoop. When the great tribulation hits, Michael's the dude who's gotta watch Israel's back. He's more than just a fighter, he's Israel's guardian angel, handpicked by God. This angel means business. One time, just one of God's angels took out 185,000 men. Angels aren't your fluffy, gentle types, they're powerful beings. Ever heard of that showdown between Michael and the devil over Moses' body? Jude 1 verse 9 shows Michael didn't trash talk the devil, he just said, the Lord rebuke you. Angel Michael wasn't flexing his own authority but calling in God's name. Now, there are some groups claiming Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Nope. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Michael saying the Lord rebuke you wouldn't make sense if you were Jesus, right? Michael, for all his might, is still just an angel, not God. He's cool and all, but he's not the one to worship. Even when angels are in the house, they tell folks not to bow down to them. Michael's all about the battles. Whether it's taking down the Prince of Persia or standing up against the devil, it's all about fighting evil. He's got different gigs, and he's loyal to God. In Revelation, it's like an epic showdown with Michael leading his angels against the dragon, aka Satan, in his squad. This ain't just a fight, it's a victory party for the good guys. They kick the devil out of heaven. What's wild is that Michael's got his own angels too. So, if Satan's got his crew, 
why can't Michael? But hey, remember, as cool as Michael is, he's still just the creation of God, not on the same level. The lesson here? Angels, no matter how awesome, ain't the ones you should bow down to. They're like God's little helpers, doing his work. So, we're diving into Satan's deal. He's all about wrecking things, but not in the way you'd expect. He's the ultimate deceiver, always up to no good, and he's got more than 5,000 years of experience messing with humanity. Satan, aka Lucifer, is the master of lies. Jesus even called him out as the father of lies in John 8 verse 44. He's like the total opposite of God's truth. Truth brings life, but Satan's lies? They're straight up death. Here's the twist, Satan's never what he seems. You've seen those artworks showing him with horns and a pitchfork? Total myth. He's slicker than that. He masquerades as an angel of light, but inside, he's darkness. Isaiah and Corinthians spilled the beans on Satan's shifty nature. He was all about trying to be the big shot, wanted to rival God, and bam, got thrown out of heaven like lightning. Talk about a fall from grace. You won't find Satan in some fiery dungeon. Nope, he's roaming the earth, ruling his own kingdom. He tried to tempt Jesus with the whole world once. Crazy, right? But Jesus wasn't buying it, and Satan's gonna get his comeuppance in the end. Now, here's the thing about Satan, he's not the dude you catch red-handed in the act. He's more cunning. He slides in with smooth talk and disguises his dark schemes as good stuff. Think back to how he got Eve to bite that apple super sneaky, right? Satan's not about the obvious sins, he's all about the sly game. And hey, Hollywood's got it all wrong. Satan's not partying it up in hell, he's right here on earth, sniffing out trouble. Watch out, though. He's not walking around with a sign that says I'm the devil. Nah, he's more like a wolf in sheep's clothing, spinning his lies like it's the gospel truth. You know who's going to hype up Jesus' return? Michael, the Archangel. He's not just shouting about Jesus' comeback, he's bringing life to those who've passed on, getting them ready for the resurrection party. Imagine that scene. Now, let's talk Lucifer's fall. When you refuse to worship, you're on a downward spiral. Pride? Yeah. It's the fast track to rock bottom. The devil? Once a shining star, then became the bad guy. Whatever we don't turn into praise, turns into pride. The higher we climb, the more we gotta give props to God. It's all about giving credit where it's due. Remember, you were nothing before God blessed you, that's a fact. Praise is a big deal in the Bible. Some folks might brush it off, but guess what? Staying in a spiritual zone? Yeah, it's all about praising and worshiping God. Skip that, and you're out of God's space. Just like a fish needs water or we need oxygen, a Christian needs to praise God. Sooner or later, you gotta thank God, clap your hands, and give a loud hallelujah. This isn't the only time angels have faced off against evil. Like Gabriel in Daniel 8 verse 15, he tells Daniel about squaring off with a demon called the Prince of Persia. Angels and demons? They're duking it out, trying to win souls and nations for their teams. Let's take a moment to pray. Dear God, Help us dodge the devil's tricks in this world full of temptations. Wrap us up in your strength and protection. Let's find joy in your love and sing your praises. Keep us safe and shower us with your blessings.
We trust in you, and we know you got our backs. Another prayer, God, guide our minds away from negative vibes. Help us focus on the good stuff, renewing our thoughts, and keeping us on track with your plans. Amen. And as we kick off this new day, Lord, guide me and shield me from whatever comes my way. May your grace be my armor, and lead me on the right path. Keep my mind clear of negativity, and help me spread love and peace wherever I go. Look out for my peeps too, God. We trust you got us covered. Think about it, just one lie has the power to mess up someone's entire life. Right now, there are folks locked up in prison all because of one falsehood. Marriages? They've crashed and burned because of a single lie. And here's the kicker, some souls are in hell today because they bought into one of Satan's lies. These fake prophets? They've been doing the same trick for ages. They twist the Bible, mix in a bit of fib, and there you go, a perfect recipe for deception. And hey, they're still at it, roping in folks left, right, and center. Look at some of those super popular churches out there. They've got loads of people swayed by deceit. These folks genuinely think they're getting the truth, but they're in serious danger. Deception? It's a sneaky, wicked game. The worst part? Those being fooled don't even know it. Check this out, Christology, yep, the big deal. If you've got Jesus deal wrong, you're way off base. And trust me, there's a whole circus of Jesus versions out there. Even religions far from Christianity toss Jesus' name in the ring, claiming they're on board. It's a maze, I tell you. Matthew 24 verse 24 nails it. Fake messiahs and prophets will pop up, flashing wonders and signs. They're gonna try to pull a fast one even on the most faithful. See, Messiah means the supposed anointed, holy savior who's here to lead. But hold up, just cause someone's into Messiah Jesus doesn't mean they're vibing with the real Jesus from this Bible. Some folks twist it, saying, yeah, Jesus is the Messiah, but not the Son of God. Bingo, there's the deception. Sure, they're close to the truth, but they're missing a crucial piece. Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, can't split him up. Here's the kicker, Satan's a pro at sneaking in the near truths. He's slick like that. Take a peek at these false doctrines. Ever heard this one? Jesus was a top-notch prophet, and I'm all about his teachings, but I don't buy the whole God thing. Sounds good, right? But that'll still land you in hot water. Whether you deny Jesus altogether or just cherry-pick bits, Satan's cool with it as long as you're not sticking with the real deal from this Bible. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.